So we're going to be doing the uh, final uh, lecture. Um, chapters 14 and 15 um, are not part of the course directly. Uh, feel free to read those. Uh, they're, they're interesting on their own account. Uh, but uh, given the fact that the summer is already short, um, you know, adding those would, would have been way too much uh, material to cover. So we're going to look at chapter 13, which primarily focuses on the figure of Penelope. So this looks at heroines, um, which is an important counter to the heroes. Um, to some extent, heroines have the same sort of features as heroes as, as cult figures, like the, the heroines who had shrines to them. They would have a lot of the same features. Um, Medea, for instance, um, is a, is a strong female figure. She's covered in chapter 14, and she is not a really a nice person. Uh, but what she does is actually heroic on the same level that a, that a man's heroism would be. But this is going to look at a sort of different way of looking at heroism um, through the figure of Penelope. So, uh, heroines who are sort of looked at in this chapter are um, Helen, uh, Alcestis, and Penelope. Uh, Helen, of course, uh, is the is a hero in several ways. She is the daughter of Zeus, uh, and therefore is uh, you know uh, a demigod. Uh, she also is the one who sort of causes the Trojan War by going away with Paris, and then miraculously she escapes any pain, any requirement for payment for that action um, Menelaus basically forgives her uh, maybe because Helen had ways of entrancing him uh, Alcestis is a young woman uh, sort of the virtuous wife um, model of heroism um, she uh, is willing to die for her husband um, her husband had been given a gift by Apollo. The gift was that when it came time for him to die, if he could find someone else to take his place, um, then um, that person would be accepted in lieu of, and so he would get in, an extended life. Um, <clears throat> and when that happens, um, he, Admetus, the, the king, tries to find someone who will take his place, um, but only Alcestis uh, makes that offer. And then she's rescued by Hercules, so so she she doesn't end up actually having to deliver on that. Um, Penelope, um, of course, is the wife of Odysseus, and <clears throat> just like Hermes and Hestia, Hermes represents movement, travel, uh, like Odysseus does. Penelope, in a sense, represents home. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, women. Um, in, who are heroines might be seen as sort of groups. Um, you know, the, the, I used to use a different textbook, and in that textbook, it suggested that there were different types of uh, hero, heroic models for women. The chief one was wife of the hero or the or the the uh, mother of the hero. That was one type. Um, the one was the sidekick. Um, so this would be someone who helps the hero, but is definitely second to the hero. Um, there was also a, a type called the hero impersonator, and this would be a figure like um, Medea, who basically does the sort of thing that a male hero would do. Um, you know, she ends up killing people, she's pretty ruthless, um, and those sort of features are often the feature of Greek, Greek heroes. Um, there was one called the Bride of Death, uh, the Bride of Death um, is a common feature. The uh, Iphigenia, who's featured in Chapter 15, follows that model. And this is a young woman who dies before um, uh, she gets married. And so, in a sense, she becomes the Bride of Death. Uh, and then um, the six, th th this book then had a category called the Successful Heroine. Uh, and it put Penelope and... Um, psyche from the Cupid Psyche story in uh, together um, <clears throat> in this group uh, and these are heroines who basically sort of do their own thing they don't follow those other models exactly although Penelope is sort of a good wife so she's the wife of the hero but she has her own sort of heroic qualities um, which is separate from her husband so she's not just the one 
who is the mother of the hero or the wife of the hero. Um, so, um, it's, you know, because the, the heroic model is largely geared towards males, uh, it's, diff it's difficult to define the, the heroine path. Um, there are scholars who have done that. It's been a big thing in feminist scholars over the last 30 or 40 years, um, you know, looking at the, the heroine story. Um, heroes can help or hinder their people. And the female, the heroine, most of the time tends to be one who is helping the people, um, is more self-sacrificing. There are some male heroes who are like that, but not many. Um, and then you've got male heroes who are definitely hindering. Now, Medea might qualify as a hindering hero. Um, women were, had no legal rights in the Greek world, uh, in Greek society. Um, Greek royalty, like in places like Sparta that had kings or um, other cities that had kings, the queen probably had a certain amount of power. Certainly she had a fair amount of soft power. She could influence her husband and that could get things done. Um, but there was no legal recognition of that power. And women could not go to court. They could not sue anyone. Uh, if a woman, in effect, was raped, it would really be up to her male relatives to bring charges or, you know, um, beat the crap out of the guy who, who, you know, who would attack their woman. So that's the way it's seen. It's seen through a male lens, and women are sort of like an add-on. Uh, and the person that uh, looked after the, the woman would ordinarily be her father or her husband, but could be some other male relative. So if her father died and she was still young, an, you know, an uncle, or if the grandfather was still alive, that person would then be her guardian. And here the word is kurios, which means lord. Um, and he would make all legal decisions for, uh, for her. Um, are the heroines representative of women's actual experiences? Probably, you know, I would, I would think not a whole lot less than heroes are of the normal male experience. I mean, most, most males are not heroes. They're not people who stand alone. They're not people who, who flout sort of conventional authority and go on their own. There are some people who do that, but most people do not, right? Most people live you know, within the, within the guardrails. Uh, so here we have Heracles, the lone hero, and the hero is definitely marked in the Greek as the, a, a man alone, right? So the, it, that's the, the key thing. There are other people, and then there's the hero, right? Achilles stays alone by himself. Odysseus travels for most of his journey home by himself. So those are sort of, you know, features of the hero. And Heracles is often, you know, uh, by himself. And here he is, um, it looks like he is um, strangling someone who's um, has something to do with the sea. Maybe this is Proteus, um, the old man of the sea. Um, but you can see fish around him. And you can tell it's Hercules because he's got the lion skin, right? The, the lion skin helmet. So Helen was famous for her beauty. Um, her father was Zeus. Uh, Zeus mated with Leda, right? We saw the Leda story before. Um, Leda was married to Tyndareus, the king of Sparta. Um, <clears throat> uh, according to the story, um, uh, Leda gives birth to two eggs. And one of the eggs are um, a male and a female who are entirely mortal. And in the other are the ones that are the children of Zeus. So they have some divine blood. Um, so Polydeuces and Helen are in the divine egg and in the, in the, uh, the in fully mortal are Castor and Clytemnestra. Um, now, there's a story about Helen that Helen didn't actually go to Troy. Um, the story sprang, there was a, a guy who wrote a poem about Helen, which was basically an attack on women. And so it was... It was, you know, women are all sluts. You can't trust women, 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 women. Helen is, you know, nothing but a slut and it was opportunistic and blah, blah, blah. You know, destroyer of all sorts of things. What a, what a terrible person. Um, and then he supposedly went blind. 
Uh, so he wrote this poem. Uh, I guess it had some popularity. And then he went blind. And um, he was basically told that he had wronged Hel Helen and that he needed to apologize. And so he wrote the Palinode, the retraction poem. And in that, he basically said, yeah, actually, Helen didn't go to Troy. Uh, what happened was the gods determined that they wanted to use the war as a way to get rid of uh, heroes. There were too many heroes, and they wanted to get rid of, you know, an excess of heroes. So the way they were going to do that is have this great war. A lot of heroes would die in the war. Um, <clears throat> uh, Helen's abduction or, you know, uh, departure would be used as the uh, the excuse for the war. Uh, but, you know, what went to Troy was some sort of phantom that the gods had created, while the real Helen went to uh, Egypt. Uh, and there is a play by Euripides called The Helen, uh, where, uh, which is set in Egypt. Uh, Menelaus ends it, lands in Egypt um, and is sort of stuck there. The ships can't sail, the, the winds stop and, and everything, and he's stuck there. Uh, and Helen manages to uh, en basically engineer a means for them to get away, and they and they, it's a rescue play. Uh, but here, of course, the just like with the Iphigenia uh, among the Taurians, it is the heroine who actually engineers the rescue. There's a guy who comes to rescue the heroine, but the heroine's the one who actually engineers the rescue. Um, so on Helen. Um, Priam does not blame Helen in the Iliad. Priam, the king of Troy, does not blame Helen. But other people do. So the, the idea that Helen's not to blame is not entirely the case. Um, so, um, but uh, Hector doesn't blame Helen. Uh, Priam doesn't blame Helen. Uh, Helen feels ashamed, and she is obviously feeling some degree of social uh, shunning from, from some of the other women. <clears throat> especially those who, whose husbands had died because of her going away with Paris. Um, the, um, uh, Alan, like, women, like other women, is engaged in tapestry work, which could be seen as a sort of creative outlet for women. Um, the, uh, in book four of the Odyssey, she tells the story about Odysseus to his son, uh, Telemachus, <clears throat> who has traveled to Sparta to find out about it. She also has some magic um, uh, potions, uh, one of which she pours into the, um, uh, the wine that they drink. Uh, and what it, it's said that even if you were to witness your, your family getting killed right before you, if you drank this wine, you'd still be chill. So obviously this is some sort of like, you know, super intensive, uh, like um, quaalude uh, dr type drug um, that chills you out no matter what. And w one has to wonder, is this how she's kept Menelaus calm, given the fact that so many Greeks died because of the war? And in a sense, she could be blamed, at least in part, for the war. So here we have Paris and Helen. I do not know how we know this is Paris and Helen. Um, so uh, I don't see anything off the top of my head that would indicate that. Here we have Helen serving King Priam. Uh, and I'm not sure on this. We definitely have a woman um, pouring um, something into a bowl, pro probably some wine pouring it into a, you know, this bowl cup that he would drink from. Obviously, the person seated is a king. Um, he's old, uh, but I don't know that we can be sure that this is Helen and Priam. I, maybe something on, maybe the thing on the shield, but the thing on the shield looks sort of like the chimera, and that would indicate, you know, but the Bellerophon story would not be directly related to Troy. So I don't know how, you know, they're sure about this. Um, so, Stesichorus is the guy who went, supposedly went blind. Herodotus in his histories, he writes a, a whole book, book two, on uh, Egypt. And so, both of them talk about Helen, the real Helen being in Egypt. Uh, Euripides Helen, as I said, a devoted wife waiting her husband's return. 
<clears throat> and she is the one who sort of helps them get away um, because the king there has her sort of under uh, under arrest. Uh, basically, he wants to marry her because she's so beautiful, and uh, you know he's not going to let her go. Um, so she has to sort of figure out a way that that she and her real husband can get away. Um, so one of the things that, of course, Helen and <clears throat> her ghost or her, you know, her doppelganger um, do feed into is this idea of women and the control of their movement. Uh, women in, in Athens especially were largely homebound. I mean, they didn't really go other places other than home maybe to the market or to the to the water you know where the spring was to get water but you know that was they were very limited in, in their actual movements they did not have freedom of movement and when women do have freedom of movement and helen certainly does there's a certain anxiety around that so here we've got helen reclaimed by menelaus uh, and again, I don't know for sure. The only figure I know for sure here is the figure in the sort of center of the woman, presumably, is Helen. But right next to him is not um, Menelaus, but is uh, Hermes. And you can tell because he has the caduceus, uh, right? The, sti the uh, stick with what looks like a broken figure eight on top of it. Um, I don't see names written as sometimes happens, which would help. But that's the only figure that I know of. The Alcestis. Um, so the main thing we know about Alcestis is from Euripides' play, The Alcestis. It is the oldest play by Euripides we have. Uh, it's from 438. Um, Euripides at that point probably had only been writing tragedies for a few years. Um, um, but <clears throat> uh, it is it, something, it, it was not one of the tragedies, but we've used as the satyr play, but without satyrs. That's a possibility I don't really know. Not all of Euripides' tragedies have a, an unhappy ending, and this one certainly does not. Um, so um, Apollo, at one point, had uh, been punished for something. I think it was rest restoring someone to life who, who was supposed to be dead. Um, and... Um, Apollo was told that he was basically, he, he had lost his divine power and that he had to serve uh, a human king as a slave. And he was given to this guy named Admetus. Uh, Admetus did not abuse Apollo in the, dur during the year that Apollo was his slave. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't know that he knew for sure that it was Apollo. Um, I don't know that part of the story that well, but... Um, he didn't abuse Apollo, and so Apollo felt that Admetus deserved a reward uh, for being a, a kind and generous master. And so Apollo gave Admetus um, the ability to basically get a buy uh, on his death sentence. So when he de when he was going to die, he could get someone else to to take his place. Um, and Thanatos is death, and so. Admetus knows he's going to die soon uh, at the start of the play. He travels around to other people, including his parents, who are still alive. Uh, and basically, in, his, in their case, he basically figures, you're old, and this would be a great gift you could give your son. So how about it? And they refuse him. They basically say, oh, look, at, you know, look at the time, and we've got to be somewhere else. Um, so they do not, uh, they politely refuse him, but they do refuse him. Alcestis agrees um, to take his place, but it's interesting because Alcestis puts it in terms of, I'm going to do this for you, but you owe me big time. You know, basically, you can't remarry, you can, none of the other things can happen because basically I'm giving up my life for you and now you can't basically go and have like an enjoyable life without me. Um, so there's a little bit of friction there between the couple. Uh, Alcestis then goes off with Thanatos, uh, and Hercules shows up. Um, Her Heracles shows up, and Heracles in this is, is portrayed as a, a big drunken lout. Now, he's still Heracles, so he still has the power, but he's basically drunk. So he gets there, 
Um, and Midas doesn't tell him anything about the fact that his wife has been taken by death. Um, and um, But he's not being a, a particularly good host because, you know, of course he's grieving because his wife has, has just left with death. Um, Heracles doesn't understand this, and at one point uh, he comes onto the stage um, chasing, in effect, the, the, the chief servant, uh, the major domo in the house, who's supposed to be taking care of him. And he says, I want more wine, I want more wine. And, and then the major domo turns to him and says, have you no you know, uh, decency about you? The master's just lost his wife. Uh, and basically explains the situation. And here you are, and all you want to do is get drunk. And that sort of sobers Heracles up, and he goes off, off screen, wrestles with death, and comes back with with Alcestis, happy a happy reunion. But there is some muted joy because remember there had been a, a certain bitter quality to their party. I mean, after all, Admetus in effect was afraid to die, um, so that makes him sort of a coward. Uh, and he is depending on Alcestis to, um, or he's basically agreeing to to someone dying in his place, which you know is, I mean, no one's no one looks forward to dying, but asking someone to die in your place, you know, is 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 pretty cheesy. So um, they are re reunited, but there's some questions. So here we have a, a drawing of a vase painting. Um, showing uh, Alcestis and Admetus. And here we can actually see, because it actually says, like, their names. So the couple is definitely Alcestis and Admetus. And then um, these are Etruscan demons. So this is an Etruscan vase. So the Etruscans were people who lived in Italy, north of Rome. Right? There was an area north of Rome called Etruria. Um, and the Etruscans who lived in Etruria they spoke a language that was not Indo-European. We have thousands, maybe millions of inscriptions and other writings in Etruscan. We still, it still has not been deciphered. We don't know what it says. We know what it sounds like because the writing script they used was based on the Greek. So we, we can figure out what, what the thing sounded like. And the Etruscans had this view of um, life as being great uh, they're mainly looking at the, the the wealthy and fortunate in life. But life is great. You live a good life. You enjoy yourself. But when you die, when you go to the underworld, the underworld is inhabited by demons. And here are these figures that are going to take uh, Alcestis away. Those figures are look like demons. And this is, I think, where the Romans have this tremendous fascination with demons. Uh, you see it in the selections from the uh, from the... Aeneid uh, from Book Seven, Electo, uh, when she appears, is like one of these demons. Well, where do the Romans get that? They get it from the Etruscans, who had controlled Rome for about 150 years, uh, and they were always close neighbors. So Etruscan ideas are going to, you know, seep into the Roman consciousness. Um, so it's a little bit different than the, what the Greek thing would have shown, which would have shown Thanatos, who probably would have been looked like a guy in in armor. Um, but he would not have looked like this. Um, so here is a wall painting uh, from Pompeii uh, of Alcestis uh, sort of meditating, choosing to die, thinking about it. Penelope is known for her loyalty to her husband Odysseus. Um, she is uh, compared to uh, a daughter of Pandarius. Um, uh, to be honest, I, I don't recall exactly what that comparison is, so I will not comment on it, um, but it's something the book will, I guess, talk about. Um, but in addition to her loyalty, she's also known for her cleverness. So she comes up with a plan to trick the suitors so she doesn't have to choose a suitor for three years. That trick gets found out, and then, of course, she, has, she at the point that we enter the story, she is... Basically, she's got a week or two in which she has to choose one of the suitors. And so, you know, it's really like she's stuck. I mean, at this point, she really can't really refuse because she said she'd make a choice um, except for this funeral um, shroud that she was uh, weaving for um, uh, for uh, Odysseus's father, who's still alive, but um, Laertes, but, but he... Um, 
uh, but he's old and he's going to die soon and his wife had died so presumably he's not going to live that much longer and so she figures out you know this duty I have to do and you have to let me and they agree but what she does is she unweaves part of it every night and so it's taking her forever to, to get the thing done and then um, she's ratted out by one of the serving women who and then of course she has to complete it quickly and now she has to make the choice. She also is the one who comes up with the contest of the bow. Uh, there's uh, Odysseus for some reason left his bow at home. Uh, this bow can only be strung by him. So he, the bow of course would be would be uh, you know a stick would be a stick that you have to bend and you have to notch the um, uh, the string on it. Um, and of course it takes a lot of power to bend the bow. Uh, and it's the bend of the bow that gives the gives the arrow its its power, right? The bend of the bow and the the bending of the string. When you let go, all that built up energy, of course, causes the arrow to go flying uh, at great speed. So Odysseus uh, is the only one apparently able to string the bow, and so she says, "Well, if someone, one of the suitors, can do that, then I then he would be suitable, so I would marry that person." Um, it is unclear, this is in book 19 where she suggests this, the, the actual stringing of the bow happens in the next book, book 20, uh, and then there's the battle in the hall in book 20, 21 where Odysseus kills the suitors with the bow, right? Because he, he, he's disguised as a beggar and he says, well, let me try. And they figure, well, what the hell is this just some old guy? He obviously is not going to be able to do it when we couldn't. And of course he does do it and everyone's amazed. And then he shoots... Um, it threw, threw the arrow through these uh, axe heads, and that you know, so he's basically won the contest. Um, but then he turns uh, with one of the arrows and he kills one of the suitors. And at first they think he's drunk, and he kills a few suitors before they realize, uh oh. And then he basically says, yes, yeah, so Odysseus has come home. So he reveals himself, and then he's got weapons. They don't at that point. So he's managed to he he manages uh, to rack up a pretty nice score uh, at that moment. But it's Penelope who suggests the contest, and some people think that she already recognizes Odysseus. He's in disguise, but one of Penelope's um, nicknames or the the adjective, the epithet used of Penelope is periphron, which means circumspect. She's very careful. She's a very careful woman, and she makes the perfect match for Odysseus, who's the tricky guy. So she's going to be careful. So. This seems a rather bold thing to do because, of course, if she's wrong, she's going to end up probably having to marry one of the suitors, and that's going to be a problem. So, why does she do it? It seems likely that she does recognize Odysseus, although the, the poem does not say that, but um, it seems likely. Cautious woman, she's, in this case, giving her husband the weapon he's going to need to take care of the suitors. After he defeats the suitors and, and kills the suitors, um, Telemachus says, look, you know, mom, dad's home. This is dad, right? He still looks like a beggar. She says she still is not sure, but the guy has saved her house by killing the suitors, and so he deserves to sleep in a good bed, and so she asks for Odysseus's bed to be brought out into the hallway where he can sleep, right? She's not going to go to bed with him, but, you know, he can sleep in this a bed in the hall. The bed, of course, has a, uh, one of its legs is actually a tree trunk, so it's actually still rooted to the ground, and in fact, the whole house was built around the bedroom. So the bedroom was sort of created first, and then the, the rest of the, and so Odysseus says, who cut, who cut, the, the, the leg, um, who messed with my bed. Uh, and that's when she basically says, ah, my husband's come home. So she poses this trick to him to get him to reveal himself um, for sure. So again, her carefulness, right, she, peripheral, uh, cautious, circumspect. Uh, and she's a poet, right? She, she has created a narrative, um, you know, in the, in the poem. Um, the, the weaving of the tapestry, the weaving of tales, all of that stuff sort of 
shows her to be a poet. And some people look to the figure of Penelope and Circe and Calypso, the three main female figures, as maybe evidence that what the, uh, the author of the, uh, uh, of the Odyssey was in fact a woman, maybe a woman who was related in some way to um, Homer. So here we have a, a seated woman, um, Here we have Odysseus killing the suitors. Um, the image on the right is on the other side of the cup. So this is a cup, and on one side you can see a guy with a bow and he's pulling arrows. Behind him are serving women, and then over on the other side you've got their banqueters. You've got like a little banquet bench. Uh, one guy's holding up a table. Uh, one guy's just taking it in, in the neck. Um, so this clearly shows that scene. So the focus in in the in the three heroines uh, here mentioned, um, they all are wives of heroes. Uh, Helen's the wife of Menelaus, Alcestis the wife of Admetus, Penelope the wife of Odysseus. Um, they are all focused on the house in a sense. Um, although Helen, of course, breaks that because she's the woman who leaves home ostensibly. Well. She leaves home anyways, because whether she goes to Troy or not, she's not at home. Um, Alcestis, um, you know, <clears throat> has lived her whole life, presumably, um, you know, in the, in the area that she lives in. And then she goes with death. But, you know, of course, she's not expecting to come back from that. Penelope didn't, never leaves the home area. Uh, the excerpts that come from the Odyssey are Book 19, where we get the contest of the bow suggested. In book 23, where Odysseus tells Penelope of his adventures, but she also tells him the story of what it was for her to be alone for those 20 years. The theory here looks at, like, what would be the paradigm for heroines, right? So you've got, you know, Lord Raglan's scheme, you've got Auden's scheme, you've got uh, Prop's scheme for heroes, but what about heroines? Uh, and the suggestion here is that the story of, uh, that Apuleius tells of Amor or Cupid and Psyche, uh, you, most of the time people say uh, Cupid and Psyche, um, from his work called The Golden Ass. Now, Apuleius, uh, Lucius Apuleius was from North Africa. Um, he had Roman citizenship, so he was Roman in that sense, but but he was, he was not actually Roman. He was North African. He was a um, uh, he mainly had studied the law, so he was a g guy involved in the law in North Africa. And he wrote a, a romance, right, one of these novels that involve a lot of travel, um, called Lucius or the Golden Ass. Uh, and in the story, this got the title character, Lucius, uh, visits a friend. Um, then one night while he's visiting the friend, he goes out into sort of the wood, wooded area near where the guy lives, where he happens to see witches performing some sort of ceremony. And then as a result, he is turned into a blonde donkey, right? So a golden ass. And he spends his, he's in that shape for almost the, the, the entire rest of the work. Um, it ends with him in a parade for Isis. There's a big ceremony for Isis. Uh, and in this uh, parade, he prays to Isis in, as a donkey, and he's transformed back into his human form. So he's rescued uh, by the goddess, uh, in this case, Isis. Um, but the story of Cupid and Psyche is the story that an old woman tells a younger woman, there, there are servants in this house, it, and they're basically sleeping in the barn. So they're sleeping in the barn, and the donkey is there too, so he hears the story. So it, in a sense, it has nothing to do with Lucius's story, but it's a nice story. Uh, and the story goes as follows. There's this beautiful woman named Psyche. Uh, obviously, that her name is related to the Greek word that means the soul, right? Um, and psychology comes from that. Um, she's a beautiful woman. And everyone in the town that she lives in compares her to Venus, to Aphrodite. And Aphrodite, uh, or Venus, I'll use the Romans since it's a Rome, Roman work, 
uh, Venus gets very angry at this, um, that people are referring to uh, a mortal woman as being like her. So she sends Cupid down, her son down, to shoot Psyche with an arrow to make her fall in love with some animal. So the, what will happen if the plan works is he'll shoot Psyche. Psyche will fall in love with like a donkey or some wild animal and basically have sex with the animal right there in view of everyone. And of course, that will horrify everyone because that's just not done, at least in public. Um, and um, so that's the plan. When Cupid goes down and he's getting ready to actually shoot her, he takes the arrow out and he sees her and he falls in love with Psyche. And he drops, like she's so beautiful, he can't believe it. He drops the arrow, it hits him in the foot, and he falls madly in love with her. He then um, appears to her as sort of like a disembodied voice um, and, you know, says, go to the edge of this cliff and I will send the winds for you and the winds will carry you aloft and they will carry you to my palace, which is up on a mountain, uh, and there we will be married and you will be my wife. And so she sort of goes along with that. Um, but it's always dark when she gets there and she never sees her groom, right? She, I mean, the, the two of them sleep together, they have sex, but she doesn't see what he looks like. Uh, and he has her promise that she will never try to see what he looks like. And of course, you know, the palace is beautiful and it's all gold and, you know, it's great, right? She's basically had been you know, lower class, uh, and now this, you know, she's living the good life. Um, she has two sisters, right? And just like the evil stepsisters in folktales, these sisters are jealous of Psyche's happiness. And so what they do is they introduce the idea that probably what kidnapped you is some monster. And the monster doesn't want you to see because, of course, you'd be horrified and would try to kill the monster. But that monster will eventually eat you up, right? So the monster is, you know, you're, it's bad uh, and you should be worried. And so what you should do the next time, you know, you, you have a, 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 some time together is when your partner is asleep, get a lamp and look at the monster. And then you'll know that it's a monster and that we've saved you and, you know, you'll have to get out of there. Um, so she does that. Of course, it's Cupid and not a monster. So when um, w the next time that she goes, um, she um, sees uh, she she gets the lamp. She's you know leaning over, uh, looking at him. She's amazed at how handsome uh, Cupid looks. Right? Wow! This is this is I hit the jackpot. Some of the oil in the lamp rips out it's hot oil it hits cupid in the shoulder he immediately wakes up he sees her seeing him in the light um and then he flies off right because she's broken her promise right the promise and the reason for the promise was he's trying to keep this secret from mom right because he was supposed to ruin her life um he's sort of taken out her circulation but she's not going to be happy that that he is you know uh, the husband of um her bitter enemy um so he, he whisks off venus does find out about the situation and venus then demands that um, psyche carry out a series of impossible tasks uh, one is there's a barn full of grain and it's different types of grain and she has to separate them into piles by type uh, and there's no way to in one night and there's no way to do that but she is so beloved this is like sort of snow white She's so beloved by everyone that even the ants love her and the ants basically all divide up the grain. So the grain, you know, that is taken care of. One of the things that she's told to do is to get a box from Persephone um, and she's told not to look in the box. Well, she goes to the underworld, she gets the box and she's coming back with it. But then, she, you know, curiosity takes, gets the better of her. She opens it up and she basically goes into an, an eternal sleep. Um, but she's rescued from that. Uh, the two sisters, by the way, uh, things end badly because um, 
before uh, Venus shows up, uh, the two sisters hope that now that she's basically messed up with this figure, that she can, that one of them can maybe hook up with the boyfriend and, uh, and ha lead the good life. Uh, and so she tells them, well, here's what you do. You run down this hill, and then when you get to the, get to the edge of the cliff, uh, you call out to the winds, and the winds will pick you up and carry you off to this mountain. Well, they do that, and of course, there's no wind. So they call to the winds as they're jumping off the cliff, and then there's no wind. So like Wile E. Coyote, they just go straight down to the bottom of the canyon. Uh, so, you know, Psyche has a, has a cruel side here. Um, so Cupid appeals to Jupiter. Um, when Psyche goes into this eternal sleep and she is released from it uh, and then the two of them are married on Mount Olympus and Psyche gives birth to a daughter named Joy. Right? So obviously this is an allegory um, that the soul and love produce joy. Right? It's fairly straightforward. It's a beautifully told story but you know the, the, the sort of purpose of the story is pretty pretty obvious. Um, and Psyche's quest is like the quest of many Greek heroes, right? She has to go and do all these impossible tasks, just like Hercules has to go and do his impossible labors. So, um, and you can look at this as, you know, indicative of human love or divine love, right? That only divine love is like this because, you know, she does become a goddess. Um, and of course the Christian, uh, who, picked up this story they're looking at as right the 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 love of god you know ennobles the soul of man and you know gets you to sort of heaven um and of course this is very much like a fairy tale and so it actually reads like a fairy tale and uh fairy tales have similar things right the evil stepsisters um the handsome prince that seems beyond the the, you know, the possibility for the poor girl, uh, all that stuff. So here we have Psyche and Amor, uh, or Psyche and Cupid, and we can tell because of the wings. Um, I do have to say that, that uh, um, you know, um, Psyche here is the one who's sort of embracing Cupid, and Cupid looks a little bit squeamish there, um, it seems to me, but um, this isn't a great picture, and it doesn't look like it's a well-preserved well, record, well um, preserved statue. So the um, scholarship, um, you know, continues, you know, how do we define heroism um, for female, for heroines? Um, one thing, Lee Edwards talks about this and says that, like, for the, for the heroines, it rarely involves physical strength. And it rarely involves travel. Now, the, the Psyche case would be an exception. That does involve travel. She does travel. And the heroines in all the Greek romances, it involves travel. The boy meets girl, boy loses girl, and then boy and girl travel around the Roman Empire until they come back together again. So, but ordinarily, no, right? The woman doesn't leave home, right? It's the guy who goes away and comes back. The woman, in a sense, has to have her heroic adventure at home. Um, we also have here that the heroine defines herself not sort of by in opposition to everyone else, which is what the hero does, right? The hero is a man apart. Um, here, women are part of something bigger, right? And so, you know, Psyche has her allies, right? The ants and other allies that help her. Uh, she doesn't do it alone, but she is of such a personality that she can get, inspire that sort of loyalty and help. Um, and of course, what happens with Greek heroes is later in Greek history and for the Romans, heroes are more defined by are they willing to sacrifice something for the good of the community, right? That sort of becomes more the, the model. And that is something that's associated with heroines much more than male heroes in Greek myths. Uh, so here we've got a picture of Penelope with her weaving in front of her. The comparison section looks again to uh, Roman uh, Roman author. This is Ovid, um, and uh, Ovid 
wrote a work called the Heroides, the Heroines. Um, now, he did go into exile. Uh, he went into exile, um, I think it was in 8 BCE. Um, so the Metamorphoses had come out, uh, his, his sort of greatest work. Uh, and so had the Heroides, which was an early work, and some other works of his. Um, he fell afoul of the Emperor Augustus, uh, the first Roman Emperor. Um, the Emperor Augustus was very much a moral guy, and he believed in sort of the morality of ma marriage. Um, it didn't mean that Augustus did not get a little action on the side. He did, but... Um, he frowned on this, and of course you have to be very discreet if you're going to do that. Um, the problem was that his daughter, Julia, uh, loved living the good life, and for her, living the good life was having a lot of sex with a lot of people. Apparently, even a lot of people at one time. Right? So th this, is, this was no sh shy, retiring uh, figure. For some reason, this escaped Augustus's notice, but then it... it, it it was obvious, and so here's a guy, basically like you know, think of him as like a moral majority guy, right? He's pushing this moral legislation, and his own daughter is in fact flaunting that legislation all the time. Um, and Ovid's somehow Julia knew Ovid, whether they were, you know, sexually connected or not is unknown, um, but Ovid wrote a lot of poems that dealt with weird stuff and with, you know, sexual uh, exploration. So, I mean, he's got a work called The Amores, which is uh, like famous couples of, of mythology. Uh, he's got the Heroides, the heroines, uh, that looks at the, the heroines who often don't get a say and how they would react. Uh, and then you've got um, the Ars Amatoria, the art of love, which is basically how to pick up a member of the opposite sex and not just for a platonic relationship. And then the remedium amor is the cure of love, which is how do you dump them after you pick them up, right? So this is a guy who's pushing the envelope on what is acceptable in a world that's pushing a moral agenda. And then there are some letters in which Ovid's name appears that are in the possession of Julia, so uh, Augustus can kill two birds with one stone. He can deal with Julia. He can also um, go after, um, uh, you know, uh, this poet who is basically flaunting the moral legislation and he's sent into exile. Where, and he dies in exile in AD 14. So it's quite some time later. Uh, eight, maybe AD 17. It must be that AD 17. So he's more than 20 years he's, he's in exile. Um, the uh, Heroides are written as letters by characters in Greek mythology who are women. So these are Penelope, Medea gets a letter, uh, Alcestis probably has a letter, all, all of the sort of famous um, mythological female figures all get letters to their beloved. And so this is a letter from Penelope to Odysseus. She doesn't think Odysseus will ever get the letter, but she's sending it anyways. Um, and Ovid, of course, doesn't take stuff seriously. He likes to poke fun at stuff, and so he pokes fun in this letter uh, as well. Um, so the reception, the Nachleben section, uh, you know, we can look at some female poets um, uh, and Penelope's experience. Uh, so there's Joanne Kiger, The Tapestry and the Web. Um, one of the poems actually considers that Pan, right, this nature god, might actually be the son of Penelope, which is interesting because that seems to be quite counter to her image as a very loyal wife, right, that she basically has one sexual partner, and that is her husband. Um, Louise Gluck, um, a, a famous uh, American poet, um, wrote a work called Meadowlands, um, and it's interesting because the the Meadowlands basically deal with um, how divorce affects a family. But the family here is the family of Odysseus, Penelope, and Telemachus. So mom and dad are basically going to have a divorce. And how is that affecting Telemachus, the son? So that's sort of an interesting twist on the thing. Um, 
And of course, by in modern standards, there are very few women who would actually remain loyal to a husband who presumed, is presumed dead, right? He's been gone 20 years, and if there was some word, and there might have been some word, that he was still alive at the end of the war so that he sailed, you still have then 10 years, right? And after, after a certain number of years, right, people are, con are considered legally dead. Um, so here, uh, this is a, a photo, um, and this is supposed to suggest the web uh, with a dreaming uh, Penelope holding uh, the ship. Of course, that ship, of course, no Greek ship looked like that. Um, there's also a work by uh, Adriana Cavarero um, in spite of Plato that focuses on the fact that Penelope and her web are a symbol for creativity and that Penelope, unlike Odysseus, learns to be a creative hero while stuck at home. In other words, what could be considered a prison, she actually turns into sort of a creative studio or workshop. Right, so that sort of is, is uh, Cavarero's sort of point of view. Now, Margaret Atwood, the person who wrote The Handmaid's Tale, which is, of course, you know, uh, strangely significant these days, again, um, also wrote a work that came out in 2006 called The Penelope Ad, which basically would mean the poem about Penelope. It's not a poem, it's, it's, a, it's uh, yeah, a novel. Um, but it looks at Penelope why Odysseus is away, and that Penelope is a cowardly and cruel slave owner. So uh, in, the, in the Odyssey, uh, when Odysseus gets home, he finds out that there are a couple of servants who have remained loyal to him, while there are a lot of serving women who have become disloyal and hooked up with the suitors. Well, in Atwood's version, they have a reason for that because they have been badly treated by Penelope. Um, and so the death of the handmaidens but takes on a whole new meaning, right? These are not the, the servants who were disloyal to their, to the, to their mistress, who was all good. Um, this is basically payback from the master and the, and, and the mistress uh, against the slave woman who dared um, you know, speak out and, uh, you know, and act in a way that did not directly benefit them. So, <clears throat> which is, which is sort of an interesting take because that is not, the, that is definitely not the take in the Odyssey. The Odyssey presents her as the moral exemplar and she's contrasted to Clytemnestra in the, in the Odyssey. Clytemnestra is the opposite end of that spectrum. She's the disloyal wife who killed her husband, Agamemnon. Um, and that becomes a theme throughout the whole poem where, you know, will Penelope be the loyal wife or will she, in fact, um, toss Odysseus under the bus? Um, and that is not what happens. But the Penelope ad does suggest um, a different way of looking at that story, which definitely casts Penelope in a bad light.